Hey friends, welcome to the uh, online broadcast for First Presbyterian Church. Grateful that you would join us this morning. A little different for us this morning, and we wanted to tell you about a couple of things that are happening, changes to our normal weekly routine. We're actually planning on worshiping outside this morning. We'll be out in a tent at 10 a.m. on the north side of our church property. If you're local, you still have time to join with us. We'd love to have you. Um, there'll be a potluck breakfast following after the, the worship service. We are kind of kicking off the fall. We're celebrating a new playground and kind of uh, also remembering that it's been a little over 20 years ago that we moved into our current building and just kind of these three things coincided in a way that we thought we'd take a morning and celebrate that with our church family. We'd love to have you involved if you can get there. If not, we have a full service plan for you today. Michael, we've actually kind of uh, recycled a few things, some things that we hope will be helpful again. We hope maybe um, if you did hear them the first time, they'll still be helpful. If you didn't hear them, we think that you, we think they'll be good. One of the interesting things about assembling a service like that, it, this, is we get a chance to think through uh, maybe things that have been themes that connect different sermons. So what you're going to have today is actually two sermons from two very radically different contexts. We'll actually tell you a little bit about them as we get closer to them, but uh, we hope that you'll find them helpful, and we certainly uh, want you to know uh, that we're thinking about you if you can't be with us uh, behind our building today as we celebrate outside. Know that we're thinking of you. That said, that service is going to be recorded, and uh, it will be uploaded later in the week, so make sure that you're subscribed and that you get emails from the church because we will notify you when that's available if you would like to hear the celebration that happens this Sunday morning. Uh, that said, uh, the other thing we'll make you aware of, of course, fall is here. Kids are back in school. We celebrate with families as they look ahead and as they continue to uh, work towards a new routine. We here at the church are preparing for our own fall routines. So uh, if you want to see the updated list of kickoff dates, you'll find that on our website. Clint and I are excited to begin to prepare to return to our regular schedule of daily Bible studies and weekly podcasts. All that stuff is coming up. Uh, you will see the dates for that on the website as well as all of our correspondence that will be coming out in the coming days. Uh, but of course, all this is said. Uh, the most important thing we want to share with you today is welcome. We're glad that you're here, glad that you would spend time with us in worship, and hope that what you find as we go through this morning together will be both encouraging and challenging as you seek to follow Jesus Christ. If you're here with us on radio or online, we're grateful, and as we worship together, we hope that you are equipped and inspired to continue to serve Christ faithfully.
mentioned at the beginning of our broadcast this morning, that leads us to our first of two sermons. And Clint, for this, we're reaching back all the way to November of 2020. And uh, things as we continue to progress through that season, of course, changed often. And what we find here is a moment where we were experimenting with a sermon that we might both contribute in the midst of at the same time, except we would switch off uh, literally coming each to the pulpit at each time. And one of the reasons that this particular sermon stuck out to me, Clint, was it was a moment in which we looked at the parable of the talents, this beautiful story where Jesus uh, reminds us that each of us has been given a gift and we're called to be faithful to it. And we found what could be seen as a very harsh or difficult parable as an actual invitation to take stock of the gifts that God has given us and to seek to be faithful in using those gifts to bring glory to God. And I think it may not be a complicated message, but as we as a congregation today celebrate the gifts that God has given us as we do that at 10 o'clock in this joint service outside, I think that this is a good day for us to remember that, and it comes to us this day as we start with that sermon. As I remember it, Michael, we had come back to the sanctuary then. Not everyone was with us. It was also in the, the midst of a, a political season. There was a lot happening on it happening at the time, and it seemed a, an opportune moment to go to that parable remembering that the reason we are given gifts is not simply to have them, but to use them, and that we are called constantly to be investing what Christ gives us into the work of Jesus and into the lives of other people, and that this is fundamental to who we're seeking to be as the church. Our scripture this morning will be, I think, familiar to you, one that I suspect you've heard many times. It's one of Jesus' best-known parables, uh, sometimes called the parable of the servants, sometimes called the parable of the bags of gold, sometimes the treasure, parable of the master, probably most often known as the parable of the talents. It's from Matthew, the 25th chapter. And as you hear these words, listen in them for what God says to each of us. Jesus said, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants, and he entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one, each according to his ability, and then he went on his journey. And the man who had received the five bags of gold went out at once and put the money to work and gained five more. The one with two bags of gold gained two more. The man who received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid the master's money, for he was afraid. After a long time, the master of the servants returned, and he settled accounts with them. The man who received five bags of gold brought the other five and said, Master, you entrusted me with five bags. See, I gained five more. His master said, Well done, good, faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came, and he said, Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold, and I have gained two more. And his master also replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. Because you've been faithful with a few things, I'll put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who received one bag of gold came and said, Master, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered. I was afraid. So I went out and hid your gold in the ground, and see, here it is, what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered. Then shouldn't you have put the money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would at least have received it back with interest. And then the master said, take the bag of gold from him. Give it to the one who has ten. For whoever has will be given more and will have an abundance. Whoever doesn't have, even what they have will be taken. And throw the worthless servant outside in the darkness, for there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord, we find ourselves in a 
time of endless questions. Am I getting sick? Should I get tested? Should I go out with friends? Should I plan Thanksgiving? Is the election over? Who will rule the country? Who will lead in these moments? And a thousand others that are personal to each of us. In these moments of uncertainty, may You, by Your Spirit, point us back to the one thing that we might know most deeply. The truth of Jesus Christ. The love and mercy of Your Son. And as we strain to hear His Word to us today, may we put aside all that we don't know in these moments that we may remember again that the one thing we know is enough. In Him we pray. Amen. So, of all Jesus' parables, I think this is one of the most accessible. And what I mean by that, it's one of the ones that translates the best from the ancient world. You don't have to know much about Jesus' day and age to understand this parable. A man has a ton of money. And he calls three servants to help him. And he gives them each that money and asks them to put it to work while he's gone. Historically, this is known as the parable of the talent. A talent in the ancient world is just a measure of weight, like a pound or a ton. It's specifically a weight of money. It is years and years, maybe 25 years of annual wages. It's an unimaginable amount of money for most of Jesus' hearers. Through a kind of fortunate circumstance, in about the 15th century, we begin to use in English the word talent to refer to our gifts and abilities. And oddly enough, we do that exactly because of this parable. The word talent is in our language from Greek to English because of this story. The only problem that creates is that we sometimes think of talents as small. If I asked you what are your talents, you might say, oh, I can sing a little bit, or oh, I, I'm okay at art, or yeah, I guess I can make baskets, or whatever it might be, like like basket baskets, not weaving. Maybe you make weaving baskets also. But we tend to think sometimes of talents as not that big of a deal. We are kind of uh, humble about them and we minimize that language a little bit. Well, it helps to remember that in the days of Jesus' parable, people had never seen a talent of money. The vast majority Jesus would have spoken to can't even conceive of it. It's like me saying a billion dollars to you. A million dollars to you. The idea that this master would write million dollar checks, five and two and one, to servants is incredible. Unimaginable. And it helps us, I think, to remember as we go through the parable, that rather than talking about insignificant things, Jesus' story pictures for us staggering amounts of unimaginable worth. And that we should keep that in mind when we think about our time, our treasure, and our talent. And in Matthew's version, the ending is the harshest. It is troubling to us to read the end and to listen to Jesus say and describe how this one servant is treated and how he is held accountable for failing the master. So it's likely this isn't your first time hearing this story. And if that's true, I suspect it's because you've heard this story before in a stewardship sermon. This text is, I think, very quickly turned to as we think about being stewards of the gifts that God has given us. 
Uh, in the Presbyterian Church, we don't have patron saints, but this would be the patron parable of Stewardship Sundays. It's the place where we turn, and quite frankly, it makes sense. If you're a financially-minded person, the idea that Jesus talks about, hey, at least go get some interest on your money, don't go dig a hole that doesn't help you, makes sense. It just it, it is a clear sort of example. But what we need to be careful of in parables is to not take the parable overly literally. We might miss the meaning of the parable in the same way that we don't go to the parable of the soils. You remember the story Jesus told about the farmer who goes and casts seed and some lands on the path, some lands in good soil, some lands on rocky soil. The point isn't for Jesus to teach them how to do farming. In truth, no farmer throws their soil on the rocky ground. Jesus is using a thing that the people understand to teach them a spiritual lesson that they wouldn't see otherwise. And I would encourage us to look beyond the financial story here to see the spiritual significance. And I would point to the very troubling ending that Pastor Clint just mentioned. It doesn't make sense to us that a person missed out on the 1% interest at the bank should be thrown out into the darkness where there's gnashing of teeth because that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not saying if you miss out on the uh, bank's interest that, that you should be thrown into this, this horrible place, but rather the one who fails to be accountable to what God has called them to do the one who is unable or unwilling to use the gifts that God has given, this one is living outside God's plan for them. And how we get there makes sense. Anyone who's worked for someone else, especially someone else with exacting or high standards, knows what it feels like to hope that what you're doing is good enough. Have you ever had an experience where you say maybe you were anxious about your work or anxious about what you did? We quickly fall into the same exact trap as this servant. If you listened as we read the text, the servant was afraid. And it is exactly that fear that drove the servant to bury his talent as opposed to use it in a way that would continue to uh, further the master's goals. I think here we begin to see the spiritual meaning of the text. Friends, each one of us has been given gifts. We are called to use them. But the only way that we could possibly take the risks required to open our hands, the willingness to give ourselves to others, which make no mistake about it, is always an act of risk. That we must be able to live our lives without fear. Not that we push the fear aside, not that the fear ever goes away, but we must be able to know what to do with that fear. Because if we leave it unchecked, we will inevitably be like this servant. And instead of using the master's gifts that we have been given, instead of being accountable servants, we become those who hoard those goods. And in fear, we live our lives uh, uh, harboring and holding these things to ourselves. Pigs, three bears, three servants. And the three servants have the same opportunity. They also have the same risk. They have the same calling. I have, I'm going to guess, preached this text I don't know, a dozen times through the years. And one of the things that's difficult about it is that you know where it's going. Use your talents. Be giving. Invest. Don't be afraid. So this year, as I read through this story again, I I couldn't help, I don't know why, but I began to think about the moment the servant buries the bag of gold, buries the talent. It seems to me that in a sense, this text is about what gets buried and what doesn't. Instead of burying his fear, he he buries his opportunity. The other two men have the exact same situation. But rather than being afraid, 
They consider the opportunity to do something on the master's behalf. The servant thinks only of himself. And his fear paralyzes him. So rather than burying his worry, his anxiety, he buries his talent. And the question I have coming out of that is as we navigate life, what do we bury and what do we invest? What do we use? You think about things like fear. The obvious one in the passage. Or the grudges we carry against those who wronged us at some point. Or for the warriors among us, the anxiety that seems almost ever-present right now. Or for those of us who have had failings in our life, the guilt that we still drag around about hurting people or coming up short. And when we let those things drive us, when those are the aspects of our spirit that set our direction and navigate for us, inevitably, we like this servant will bury the wrong thing. We'll bury forgiveness. We'll bury peace. We'll leave behind joy or hope. Because we have invested ourselves in the wrong thing. And too often, when we invest in the wrong thing, it takes us to the wrong place. We bury the good things. We miss our chance. Because thinking of ourselves, focusing on us, we miss the opportunity to invest in what the Master gave us the chance to do. We miss our moment. And we leave the wrong thing behind. Not increasing our faith. Not increasing our generosity. Not increasing our service. Instead, paralyzed by these negative things that we refuse to let go of, and that cost us a chance to move forward. So as we've already said, the temptation of this text on the Stewardship Sunday is we focus on what we do with our talent. And we miss the parable pointing us to why we do what we do with what God has given to us. And Dedication Sunday is about us committing our why, giving intention to our lives such that we know that we are to live ourselves towards God's purpose for our lives. And that's a fundamental shift. Do we give for a sense of goodness and sort of self-will? Or do we give because God has called us to be giving people? Let me illustrate. We have a Gwecki family story, a, a marriage story that has gone down in lore. I don't know if you have this in any of your relationships, but a story that kind of pops up every now and then, we have one of those. And it involves a 26-inch Vizio TV. Let me explain. We were just newly married. In fact, I think it was our first Christmas as a couple. We got uh, some Christmas money from our families. And being a new married couple, Michael Gwecki had not yet learned how to, you know, share money with someone else. And so, believing that we needed a new 26-inch Vizio TV, I took all of the Christmas money that we received and told my lovely wife, I'm going to go get us a TV so that we can watch a TV show. About six months later, after we uh, started to actually have some conflict in our marriage, as you do, she informed me she had never wanted that TV. In fact, she had many other things she would have loved to have done with her part of the Christmas money. And every now and then, when Michael Gwecki makes a selfish choice, I'm reminded of that TV that was purchased because I thought it would be a good idea. It's not what I did with the money that was wrong. It's why I did it. I hadn't thought of my spouse. I hadn't thought of anyone other than myself. It was money in the bank account that I thought would be good for the family, but it had nothing to do with the other one who I shared my life with. This text is about being those who steward the gifts and talents of the master. 
And we miss that. As Westerners, as Americans, when we are given resources, we think of ourselves as those who are free to use them as we wish. But not so in this parable. This servant was serving the master, the one who had given these gifts for a reason. And so the servant's job was to use those talents in a way that aligned with the master's intent. So that is my question this morning. Are we using the gifts that we've been given, not towards our own ends, even if we think they're good ones, but are we using them in such a way that they bring glory to the one who has given them to us? We're not only accountable for how we use these things, we are accountable for the why, because that is why God has given them to us. If you've hung around First Press for a while, you know that this is a dedication day and it happens in this time of year as it does with many churches. We move toward the end of the year, we get to the season of Thanksgiving, we also talk stewardship and the pattern here is the chest. I'm looking at it, you'll see it as you leave the sanctuary, others will see it on pictures this morning. Our Joash chest where we collect what we call faith promises, which is just an envelope with a card in it that says in the next year... I hope to do this much. And the danger of that is that it is most often financial. One of the frustrations that we all have with church budgets is that when we talk stewardship, it often comes across as talking money. And that's not unimportant. It matters that we can pay the bills here. Of course it does. But the problem with that is when we think of stewardship as our money, we miss the bigger picture of what it means to be giving people because we have received grace. It's not just money. Christians are to be generous with their time, with their talent, with their encouragement, with their graciousness, with their hospitality. Christians are to cultivate a lifestyle of outwardness, not inwardness. We're to bury self. We are to bury selfishness. And we are to invest whatever we have been given into the life of others and service of the Master to the glory of His kingdom. And so if you've not yet put something in the box, I would encourage you to do that. It'll be up for a while. You can do that. But the challenge is that that needs to be a lifestyle. Not a day. Not a couple weeks in the fall of the year. In the same way that Thanksgiving needs to be a lifestyle. Not a holiday. We face the choice each and every day. Do we invest in the kingdom of God? And do we bury the things that keep us from investing? A year from now or so, you will get those things back. You will get those faith promises back. We don't look at them. So if you've written forgive somebody, you'll get that back. Along with the question, did you do that? If you fill out, I'm going to give X amount of money, you'll get that back. Along with the question, did you do that? Were you able to live into that promise? Were we able to enact those things in our lives? And the challenge is whether what we decide to give is an investment or whether a year from now we take out a dusty envelope and we haven't done anything with it. It hasn't moved us. Our commitment to give will either guide our life or be buried behind us and not really impact us. And that's the choice we make with the precious gifts. Whatever your talent is, whatever your abilities are, whatever you have to offer in service of Jesus Christ, that is not small. That is of staggering worth. It is a gift from none other than the Master Himself. And the invitation given to each of us is to invest it for His glory and for His purpose. May it be true 
not just today in this church, but always in the lives of God's people.
The next message we selected for today comes from last summer, from June of 2021, and it was itself a reflection of sorts as we had been out of the COVID practice for a while, as we had returned to quote unquote normal, we did so realizing that we had gained a following online, that we now had a new awareness of a ministry opportunity that was beyond the building. And one of the blessings that COVID brought us was this sense of there being more to do in that kind of digital space. And so we were reflecting on the connection between the physical church and the digital church as we looked back over where we had been and took some guesses and made some thoughts about where we might go. We borrowed from the book of Revelation, and we tried to explore these themes in that season of kind of returning to what had been, but not doing it in the same way we had done it. You know, Clint, on a morning in which we are recognizing gratitude and gifts, and we're going to be doing that behind our sanctuary, under a tent, instead of being in it, I think it's worth stepping back and remembering how grateful we are. And I would say, to your point, how we grew even in awareness for the gratitude of the gift of connection beyond a physical space. So for all of you who join us weekly by radio, uh, by internet, some from around the country, even some from around the world, uh, we are grateful for you. And we consider our relationship and the opportunity to be connected a gift. And these are some thoughts that we have had, and quite frankly, thoughts that continue to grow and continue to be formed as we as a congregation seek to strengthen that gift far into the future. So here are some thoughts, uh, of course, offered with gratitude, and we hope you find them meaningful. Friends, we turn to the scripture today, to the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, and very late in the book when John sees a vision of a new world, a new order, a new way of life. This reading is from the 21st chapter, verses 22 through 27. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by this light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Would you pray with us? Gracious Father, give us insight and depth to understand and to live your word. And may what we hear become what we live. In the name and power of Christ, amen. So one thing that may help you as you frame some of our worship experience here today is a question that has forced itself upon all of our imaginations, and that is, what does it mean to be church? What does church look like? We've all returned to that question, and I think it's something like this vision of what will be in the end, this idea that the eternal life to which we all look forward to, that beatific vision, the kingdom beyond this one, the church that is the ultimate church that combines every person from all times and places into the presence of the living Christ, that that place will never be closed. It will always be open, that there's no walls or gates that will keep some out and that will keep others in. It's a beautiful image of what will be. And in a strange way, we've uncovered and seen a tiny, small, fleeting human glimpse of it in this age and moment in which church as well has never been closed. In the online place, when you're scrolling through Facebook and you come across a Bible study or you see the worship service, it could be at 12 o'clock midnight. It could be at 3.30 a.m. when you are having a hard time sleeping. Church can be there. Not just the content of church, but the relationships that bind us together in Christ 
can be shared in that space. And I think, Clint, as I've gone through this year, it's forced me to ask some questions about assumptions I had made previous and ways that the church can be open, much like it will be in the ultimate sense later. I think that it should be very difficult in the aftermath of this past year and a half for the church to consider that its ministry is going to be exclusively what happens within its walls, that the experience of trying to understand and navigate how do we connect with people in this digital space? How do we take what we have done and renovate it and and manage it to send content to people? How do we become community with online connections in a time when we're not physically together? And this vision of a church beyond its walls, that, that's not new language, but I think we have experienced it in a new in in a new way. You know, one of the great ironies is that the space we're sitting in and the reason we're here, this small space called our studio didn't exist a year and a half ago. And it now is in many ways the primary physical space that we use to communicate to people who at least at that moment are not here now. And and this is a we would not have had this. We would not have had to think this through. We would not have had to embrace the vision of what does it mean to send the gospel out to those who might be willing to hear it in these new ways had it not been for that experience. This room has four walls, and if you're going to come and stand right outside this wall, there's a little sort of window that you could peer through the door, but there's really no place where you could look in and see this room. And I I think for me, the image of this studio, a place that exists to share the church with the world, to, to put the church out in a transparent place so that others can see and interact with and ask questions of and build relationships with, this is an an unbelievable shift in thinking. I remember, I, I don't remember the exact nature of it. I, I don't remember if it was a poster or a calendar, but I remember seeing this uh, Presbyterian publication that had all of these pictures of different doors from different churches. Mm-hmm. Some big wood doors, some big glass doors, some big metal doors, some small doors, all these different kinds of doors. And the idea was this is the invitation to come into these churches. Well, what's become abundantly clear is that the church doesn't need to have a physical door to let others in. Now, we we want to have that. We want them to come into our fellowship. We want to greet them and shake their hands and serve them in the name of Christ. But what we've been reminded of in this time is that for many, many people, hundreds, maybe even thousands, their first introduction to our church, the first door they'll walk through won't be our physical one. They'll come and they'll join us for a Bible study or they'll see worship or later they'll become participants in worship. But they join us from the outside looking in. Our, our walls that were opaque are now suddenly transparent and others can look in and see the life and gospel happening in this place. Even if they don't walk in the building, even if they don't live in our place. I had a similar experience. At some point along the way, we were experimenting with different ways to preach. We, we've tried tandem preaching. We've tried different short meditations. We've explored, are there other ways to preach in a digital format? And at some point, maybe the suggestion of the folks who were helping us, we decided we weren't locked to our campus. And so there were a couple of sermons where we went literally to places in town. We went to the old Presbyterian church. We went to a couple of um, kind of public spaces. We went to some nature preserves. And that became a a kind of new way of thinking for me. And, And really, it's an analogy to what we do when we live out the gospel. We Yes, we connect with church, but our faith is lived outside the walls of the church. The way we live is the sermon we preach, and that happens out in the world. It happens in the places we work, that we go to school, that we live, that we frequent. It happens in our own homes, and some small part of it is inside the walls of the church for some people, but all of it speaks 
to this proclamation we make as we follow Jesus Christ together. And we, we've been so blessed by our digital connections, not just as a way to keep connected with people in the church, but literally, and I think unexpectedly, as a way to welcome new people into the community. And as we continue to wrestle with what does that look like? Where does that lead us? How do we manage it? We want to use that gift well. It has really been a treasure that we've been given, and we look forward to continuing to explore ways to live that out in some new avenues. One of the great gifts that we have in this moment of return is the opportunity to see folks again. And there are so many who are returning to not just churches, they're returning to workplaces, they're returning to uh, restaurants and eating meals together. There's so many reunions happening in so many different contexts, and we give thanks for that, for, for the good news that that brings, not just to our personal lives, but to our whole nation and ultimately the world. And, you know, I think what is worth noting is some of the lessons learned during this season are not ones that are in any way replacements for the wisdom that we've carried along the way. We as Christians must always break bread together. That is one of the core insights that we find in the Lord's Supper is that we in that practice are joined together. So the physical life of the church will continue and it will bless us and we will continue to be grateful for it. But what for those who for some seasons, or even others for whole seasons of life, maybe even uh, living in other places in the country or the world who feel compelled and connected to the ministry and the work of the congregation in Northwest Iowa, what are we to do with that? And I'm reminded of an encounter that the Apostle Paul had with the Gentiles, and he comes back to the church in uh, Jerusalem, and he says to the apostolic fathers, he says, I see the Holy Spirit at work there. And the idea is, I don't have all of the answers, but what I know is that where God is, we should be active. And, and I've had some measure of that experience, where as we have sought to be faithful stewards of the gospel in our own place, we've been blessed to make new relationships with people in lots of unexpected places. And sometimes those are just folks who are down south for a couple months, and other times it's people who will not ever come to this area. But regardless of where we are, we share the faith. We find Jesus Christ the center, the unifier, and because of that, it can transform the way that we conceive of who we are as community and also the ways in which we try to interact and uphold one another in the faith. I think one of the fundamental differences that we find ourselves pursuing is that maybe at one point it was a temptation to think that we share our worship service and, and people can watch us worship. They can observe, they can listen, they, they can overhear. And, and I think what we've learned is that there is a way for people not only to do that, but to participate to literally be engaged and encounter Jesus through a kind of medium that we've not fully explored. And our hope moving forward is to enact that, to seek to live out this vision of revelation, that the gates are not shut. There are not barriers between the people and the church. Yes, things will continue to happen in our physical space. People will continue to gather and worship, but we will continue also to seek ways to make that accessible, to work in partnership with presenting that in a way that includes people who aren't physically present. And I am excited about where that goes. We, we don't have those answers yet, but it is a wonderful vision this beautiful idea that the doors and walls ultimately will not be barriers. They may be differences, but they will not be barriers, and that outsiders, those who live outside of the community, will bring the glory of God into the people of God together, united in worship and praise. And as we pursue that, 
We are grateful for any of those who are willing, who have been a part of it, and are willing to continue to take that journey with us. We look forward to seeing where God leads us in it. Let us not miss the significant wisdom that comes in the very beginning of this passage, that there's no temple in the holy city. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb is the temple. There's no one building. And I think that is one of the greatest gifts that we've received in this moment is we sometimes think of our faith as our membership in a place. I go to the Presbyterian church, the Methodist church, the Lutheran church, fill in the blank. And yes, we have communities where we find brotherhood, sisterhood in Christ, where we find connections. But one of the gifts in this moment is you don't need to be a member or whatever you think of member of First Presbyterian Church to be engaged in the life, ministry, and discipleship of this place. We can, on a Sunday, look beyond just the one sanctuary where we worship to others who are also encouraging us and where we can offer our gifts in support of others. We can, in some ways, as church, live beyond some of the human boundaries that we've created to be even more like this future kingdom where there will be no denomination, where there will be no one single building where we all gather, where Jesus Christ is enough. And that is the vision that we are called as Christians to live into. And it's not to say that in any way the online space or online communication has transformed the church forever and that we're one step better without any cons or without any downsides. Of course not. Everything will come with a with a push and a pull. But I will say, I think if we are open and willing, humble enough to listen to Christ, to see the discernment and tools and wisdom that has been both given and is being formed both through and outside of this season, friends, I think that there's a exciting future for those who seek to be in the kingdom of God. And I pray that we might use the tools that have been given to us faithfully towards that end. Both my grandmother and my grandfather were part of large families. And at some point early on in my life as a child, I remember the experience of going to one of our first bigger family gatherings. And and in that moment, I sort of thought as family, our family, as the five or six people that I lived with, that I knew, that I interacted with. And I remember we, we went to someone's house and there's this, you know, just gob of people. There's this crowd of aunts and uncles and cousins and just maybe a hundred people. It it seemed like it as a small child. And I remember in that moment it, it dawning on me and I remember the thought, my family is way bigger than I thought it was. And we've had a similar experience as we've pursued and explored this online ministry. We've been reminded in a beautiful way that our family is bigger than we thought it was. And we want to thank you for being a part of it. We want to welcome you into it and invite you to continue to interact in whatever ways we can together as this family, First Presbyterian Church, part of the much bigger family of Jesus Christ and the people of God together. We are blessed by one another. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to each and every day of growing in the faith together in the name of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, friends, we're grateful. Thank you for being with us for worship this day, whether you joined us by radio or by live stream. We hope that this has been meaningful for you. We are certainly glad that you would take the time to join us. Uh, We do hope that you will plug in to all of the things that lie ahead. Stay tuned for all of the kickoffs of our education and worship and the the very good fellowship ministries that will lie ahead in this coming year. But that is to come for today. We hope that you've been blessed, and we're glad that you would join us for worship on this Lord's Day. We're grateful for these connections, and we're thankful that you are a part of them. Thank you for being with us today in spirit and in this digital format, radio or whatever it is. We're glad that we worship together. Be blessed and be a blessing this week. And always, amen.
as we come to you and seek your patient love. Hear our hearts, hear our minds, hear the echoes of the words we cannot find. Be our hope. Three, one. 